In the early morning hours of the 18th of April, 1906, a veil of San Francisco's characteristic fog blanketed the city, an unwitting prelude to the cataclysm that was to unfold. The day had begun like any other, with the mist gently caressing the elegant contours of the James C. Flood mansion atop the city's iconic Knob Hill. But as the clock hands inched towards dawn, the earth beneath San Francisco roared to life with tremors shaking the very soul of the city, an angry titan awakening. Buildings trembled and crumbled, but the Flood Mansion, a bastion of strength, defied this ferocious upheaval. Its foundations, deeply rooted, resisted the violent shudders that ravaged the cityscape, unleashed their fury. And as the quake's aftermath saw fires igniting throughout the city, flames hungrily devouring everything in their path, the mansion was cloaked in a protective shroud, its silhouette a constant through the smoke and flames. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll share the full saga of the iconic James C. Flood mansion in Knob Hill and describe how San Francisco's most iconic mansion survived demolition. James Clare Flood was born on the 21st of October 1826 in Staten Island, New York, as the son of Irish immigrants. Indeed, Flood's journey from a modest upbringing to becoming one of America's wealthiest individuals is a vivid illustration of the American dream in the 19th century. Beginning in the bustling streets of New York, Flood was apprenticed as a carriage maker, laying the foundation for his relentless work ethic and sharp business acumen. Then, in pursuit of prosperity, Flood made a strategic move to San Francisco, following the fervor of the gold rush. The city and county of San Francisco in the 1850s, particularly for Irish immigrants like Flood, was a city of both opportunity and challenge. By then, a significant portion of the city's population, these immigrants of Irish origin often found themselves congregating in neighborhoods like the Mission District, and they took up various jobs, from labor-intensive roles in construction and dock work, to skilled trades like Flood's own carriage crafting. Thus, upon his arrival, Flood initially stuck to his professional background, continuing his trade in carriage making. However, his entrepreneurial spirit soon led him to co-found a saloon with William S. O'Brien, but this was not just any saloon. Indeed, its strategic location near the stock exchange made it a bustling hub for stockbrokers and mining magnates, an environment that soon provided Flood with a unique vantage point into the thriving world of stock investments. You see, during this era, San Francisco's finance market was burgeoning, fueled by the wealth flowing from mining ventures. Therefore, saloons like Flood's became informal trading floors and networking hotspots where deals were struck and fortunes were made and lost over drinks. Then, the discovery of silver in Nevada in 1859 marked a pivotal moment for Flood and his associates, O'Brien, James Graham Fair and John William Mackay. The four wide-eyed budding entrepreneurs ventured into the world of mining stocks, which in the 1860s was a dynamic and somewhat speculative landscape. Indeed, mining stocks were the lifeblood of investment in the West, offering immense potential for wealth to those who could navigate its volatility. Specifically in Nevada, particularly with the Comstock Lode, the largest silver deposit discovered at the time, mining stocks became a frenzy of investment and speculation. Investors from all over the country were drawn to these stocks, seeing them as a ticket to instant wealth, akin to finding a fortune in gold or silver ore. Thus, James Flood and his team's strategic investments, particularly in the Comstock Lode, proved fortuitous. Furthermore, the formation of the Consolidated Virginia Mining Company, a venture that led to the discovery of the Big Bonanza in 1873, was a watershed moment netting Flood and his associates over $150 million, equal to billions today, and etching their names in the annals of American financial history. And Flood's financial prowess was further highlighted in the aftermath of the Bank of California's failure. He and O'Brien established the Nevada Bank, transitioning from mining to finance and real estate investments, a move that amplified his influence in financial circles. And the Nevada Bank's eventual merger with Wells Fargo was a testament to Flood's far-reaching impact in the banking sector. Consequently, 
Flood's wealth enabled him to become a key player in San Francisco's social and architectural landscape. His investments in real estate transformed the city's skyline, with the Flood building on Market Street standing as a physical reminder of his family's legacy. Indeed, during this era, James Clare Flood's family life was intimately intertwined with his burgeoning business empire. He was married to Mary Emma Leary from County Wexford, Ireland, and the couple had two children, Jenny and James Leary. This familial backdrop played a crucial role in shaping his business strategies and decisions. For example, James Leary Flood, born in 1857, was particularly influenced by his father's success in real estate. Following in his father's footsteps, he developed a keen interest in the sector. This familial influence was palpable when he purchased Linden Towers, the family home, for sentimental reasons. The acquisition of Linden Towers was thus not just a real estate transaction. It symbolized the continuation of James Clare Flood's legacy through his son. However, the Flood family's dynamics were marked by complexities and challenges. James Leary's marriage to Marie Rossina, Rose Fritz, a burlesque dancer, stirred controversy within the family, leading to a temporary estrangement. This union, viewed unfavorably by the family, highlighted the tensions between personal desires and family expectations. Despite these challenges, James Leary eventually returned to the family fold, assuming the presidency of the family's Nevada bank. This move signified not only a reconciliation, but also the enduring influence of the Flood family in his life. However, before the family legacy of James Clare Flood and his descendants was to fully play out, he had a mansion to build to place atop the city of San Francisco as a beacon of his rags to richest prosperity. In the next chapter, we'll detail exactly how he built it. In the late 1870s, the silver baron James C. Flood embarked on a grand endeavor to construct a residence in San Francisco's Knob Hill that would eclipse all others in splendor. His ambition was clear, to create a home not merely as a place to live, but as a shining symbol of his considerable success and elevated societal standing. Flood's eyes turned eastward for inspiration, where the opulent, Gilded Age mansions of the East Coast sparked his imagination. To bring his vision to life, he chose Canadian architect Augustus Laver. Laver, known for his work with Thomas Stent and significant contributions to Ottawa's architectural landscape, including the Russell Hotel and parts of Parliament Hill, was the ideal choice for Flood's ambitious project. Interestingly, around the same time as the conception of the Flood mansion, Laver and Stent jointly secured the commission to design San Francisco's new city hall and law courts in 1871. This parallel project underscored the era's appetite for grandeur in both public and private spaces in the Bay Area. Now, the Flood Mansion, occupying a full city block, was more than just a large house. It was a statement, and its interiors mirrored Flood's vast wealth and high status. Indeed, the mansion was a gallery of sorts, housing art treasures from Asia and Europe. Italian artists were brought in to paint frescoes and murals, bringing a slice of European finesse to San Francisco. And the furniture was nothing short of exquisite, with pieces likely crafted by top cabinet makers like George A. Schiesti and Company, renowned for their intricate marquetry work. The decorative choices, crystal chandeliers custom made for the mansion, along with ornate copper and bronze work, elevated the luxurious atmosphere within. Furthermore, the exterior and the gardens of the Flood Mansion were equally meticulous in design. Encompassing a whole block, the mansion's presence in Knob Hill was, and is, unmistakable. The garden was an Eden of sorts, featuring exotic bushes, bronze fountains, and marble steps and balustrades, harmoniously blending with the estate's overall aesthetic. Thus, the James C. Flood Mansion was more than a home, it was a manifestation of the Gilded Age's extravagance and a physical embodiment of Flood's aspirations and status. From its inception to its completion, every aspect of the mansion was a careful consideration to detail and luxury, setting it apart as a jewel in the heart of San Francisco. However, despite the Flood family's unparalleled attention to detail, there was one piece of planning that, at the time, no one could expect. 
A natural disaster awaited the Grand Mansion that no amount of planning could be prepared for. In the early hours of the 18th of April 1906, San Francisco was struck by a devastating earthquake, reshaping the city's landscape and history forever. Among the chaos, the James Clare Flood Mansion, the recently completed grand structure on California Street, emerged as a symbol of enduring strength. Unlike many of its contemporaries, this opulent residence withstood the seismic shocks, standing firm amid widespread destruction. Indeed, the mansion's journey through this disaster is a remarkable tale of survival. Although the earthquake's ferocity spared the building's exterior, the raging fires that followed gutted its lavish interiors. Remarkably, its stone façade, a silent sentinel, withstood the fiery onslaught. And the preservation of its exterior was not merely a stroke of fortune. During the calamity, innovative tactics were employed by the fire department and army, with teams resorting to a daring yet desperate measure, creating fire breaks by demolishing unaffected buildings. This strategy, while controversial, likely played a role in shielding the mansion from the encroaching inferno. Post-earthquake, the mansion's story took a new turn. Acquired by the Pacific Union Club, a vision for its resurrection was entrusted to Willis Polk, an architect of repute, and Polk's restoration plans were ambitious. He added a third floor and flanked the mansion with new wings, meticulously using brownstone from the original quarry to maintain the building's historic integrity. This commitment to preserving its architectural heritage ensured that the mansion's rebirth was in harmony with its storied past. As the years passed, the mansion's resilience was tested again by subsequent seismic events. Each time, it stood undaunted, a living proof of the effectiveness of even its early 20th century reinforcements. And the enduring brownstone walls, once a shield against the 1906 inferno, continued to serve as the mansion's steadfast guardian. In 1966, the James C. Flood Mansion, still standing strong for more than a half century at that point, gained the prestigious title of National Historic Landmark. But this designation, a salute to its architectural splendor and historical importance, was just the beginning of its journey into the modern era. Fast forward to today, and this grand mansion has evolved into a multi-purpose hub. The Pacific Union Club, known for its exclusivity and affluence, calls it home. But the mansion's embrace extends beyond the club's members. It's also the site of an independent, not-for-profit school, fostering education and growth within its historic walls. And in the 21st century, the mansion continues to reinvent itself, adapting to the needs of the San Francisco community. Post school hours and on weekends, it transforms into a sought after venue for special events and its allure for weddings and other significant celebrations is undeniable, with its grand architecture and storied past providing a backdrop like no other. But the mansion's role isn't solely celebratory. It also stands as a pillar of education and public engagement. Through a diverse array of programs and tours, it offers a window into a different time, enlightening visitors about its former inhabitants and their lives. More than just a passive experience, these educational endeavors engage guests in a dynamic exploration of history. Yet, the educational offerings at the mansion aren't confined to traditional history lessons. They encompass interactive, hands-on experiences that stir the senses and forge a personal connection with this historical gem. This approach aligns perfectly with contemporary methods of engaging audiences in historic house museums, making history tangible and relatable. Additionally, the mansion hosts an array of special events, especially during festive seasons, which are particularly appealing to the younger crowd. These events are not just about enjoyment. They play a crucial role in ensuring the mansion remains a relevant and cherished part of the community. By attracting younger visitors, the mansion sows the seeds of future preservation, ensuring its legacy endures for generations to come. Therefore, the James C. Flood Mansion on Knob Hill is more than a relic of the past. It's a living, breathing symbol that continues to evolve and serve the community in diverse ways. From being a prestigious club and educational institution, 
to a popular venue for special occasions, it stands as a symbol of San Francisco's rich history and its unyielding spirit of adaptation and reinvention. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Have you visited the James C. Flood Mansion in San Francisco, or would like to? We love hearing from our viewers. And by the way, Happy New Year, we'll see you below. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Old Money Mansions.